Hello students, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and in this lecture I'm going to be talking about how language produces meaning, and in particular I'm going to be introducing you to a concept, a theory known as structuralism, and the way structuralism approaches and interprets the work of language. Let us begin with what might be called the standard or common sense understanding of language. This is the way we behave generally when we speak. That is that we understand a word to represent a thing in reality. So if someone says the word tree, what they mean is some specific tree, some actual thing in the world. We might call this the Adamic theory of language after the instructions that are given to Adam in Genesis about how to name the animals. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. This is the idea that Adam saw a goat somehow knew that there was an essential goatness about this goat and thus called it by its true name goat that the name of the thing identifies some essence of that thing, some reality of it. Now this notion that the word has some essential tie to the thing that it names, that it identifies the essence or the reality of that thing, has long been viewed as a problematic assertion in philosophy and linguistic theory and theology, and it's been debated uh, and analyzed and discussed over the centuries by many, many different figures. One particularly important figure in the 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, was a Swiss linguist by the name of Ferdinand de Saussure and his linguistic theories served as the foundation for what came to be called structuralism. And some basic points in this uh, that, that Saussure put forward were that we have to examine language as an entire system, not words individually, but the whole system together, and that meaning is constructed through difference in language, and that meaning is arbitrary. And his most important work published after he died was the course in general linguistics where he lays out many of these and other elements of his linguistic theory. Let us begin with Saussure's theory of the linguistic sign and how the word relates to reality. Rather than saying that the word suggests a thing, he divides up the linguistic sign into two parts, the signifier and the signified. The signifier is the word or sound. So that would be the word tree. The signified is not the thing itself, is not an actual tree, but rather the concept of a tree, what we think of when we think of a tree, what the tree means to us. Now, if the word is not tied to a specific thing, if it's not anchored in a thing, but actually refers to an abstract concept, how do we understand how words work? Well, very simply, in what he calls the chain of signifiers, Words are defined through their relations of difference and similarity. That is, words just sound different from each other. So tree is different from true, is different from crew, is different from crow. Tree is different from free, which is different from Fred, which is different from whatever. We could go on in either direction or any other direction. So we can tell that words are different from each other, not because the word has an attachment to some specific thing in reality, but because the words sound different. on the side of the signified. Again, the point that Saussure stresses is that the word does not refer to the real thing or the thing in itself, it does not refer to an actual tree, but again, to our concept of the thing, to the human experience of the thing. And this is why if someone says the word tree, each one of us is going to have a different concept, a different understanding of what that tree means. And just as there is a chain of signifiers where all of the individual signifiers are linked and differentiated by the difference of their spelling, of their sound, so too is there a chain of signifieds, 
that is, every concept, is going to be defined through relations of its difference and similarity to other concepts. So the word tree is going to be connected to all sorts of different concepts, which themselves are going to branch out, so to speak, into other concepts. So tree might suggest bush, which might suggest plant, which might suggest dig, which might suggest soil, which might suggest dirt, which might suggest dirty. Or tree might suggest leaf, which suggests green, which suggests growth, which suggests life, which might suggest death. Tree can suggest brown, which a branch, which might suggest brown, uh, might suggest bark. Tree can go to seed, root, source, father. You can see how these concepts then, any one concept is going to be linked through its relationships of difference and similarity to an infinite potentially other network of concepts. It's a whole web of meaning. So what does this tell us about the signifier and the signified? Well, that the connection between them is arbitrary. There is no reason except for the historical happenstances of how a language has developed that connects any one word to any one meaning. And in fact, the connection is in some way a function of the entire system of signifiers and signifieds. It's because we have this whole network of terms that are different from each other, but closely related, that refer to a whole network of concepts that are, again, related to each other, but different, that we have any connection between them. One signifier cannot mean anything, cannot mean any signified without the whole network, and neither can any concept have any meaning without the whole network of other concepts at its back that it is related to. So what does this tell us about meaning in speech and writing and how it's formed? Well, it tells us that meaning is always a process and a negotiation. We have an accumulation of signifiers in speech, and each new word that someone says when they're speaking, or each new word that you read when you're reading something that's been written, changes the meaning of what comes before, adds to it. So the accumulation of word after word allows us to receive the speech as a series of discrete, identifiable signifiers, but that when taken together have some larger meaning. And the signifiers suggest their concepts, their signifieds. And again, the relations of difference between those signifieds and the accumulation of one after the other allows us to interpret the meaning that's being expressed by negotiating how these different concepts relate to each other as individual concepts that nonetheless require the others in the chain, in the sentence, in the speech act, in order to have any sort of meaning. But this also tells us that there is a great deal of play in meaning. We are, once we enter language, in something of a trap. That is, words can only be defined with more words. Concepts can only be defined by referring to other concepts, which of course have to be explained in words, which refer to concepts, and so on and so forth. Once we start speaking language, it's the only thing we have in order to understand the reality around us, yet it also severs us in some way from directly understanding that reality because we can only understand our conception of it. So how do we anchor meaning? How do we fix meaning in a statement? Well, partially our syntax and grammar functions to eliminate certain possible meanings and, and guarantee certain relationships. The local context, the situation within which one is speaking or writing determines some of the meaning. The relationship of the speaker to the addressee and their identities, of course, is going to guarantee some of the meaning. That's what determines what something is when something is said, what it means, who's saying it, and to whom. And then larger con com uh, contexts, like the culture, the period. When in history is this being written? What's the culture in which it's being written? And that will, of course, determine some of the meaning. But these are always shifting and negotiable. There's always some different aspect, more information that can be brought in, some new aspect of the personalities of the speaker, addressee, some new... Um, information about the context, some change in their relationship or in the culture, some different way of interpreting and putting together these concepts even within 
any of these particular situations or contexts. So it's always shifting, always negotiable. So in some sense, meaning is never fully finalized, never fully set. And as many post-structuralist thinkers have pointed out, this leads us to the fantasy of the transcendental signifier. The transcendental signifier, the word that is self-defining, that defines itself, that is self-sufficient, that relies on no other words to give it meaning, no other concepts, that is self-identical, that doesn't mean anything else except for itself. This fantasy that has been with humans since we engaged in language, that there is some word that anchors meaning, that has a direct tie to reality, that is simultaneously inside the language system and outside it because it touches the real world, is part of it. And it guarantees truth. It guarantees meaning. It prevents any word from sliding into another meaning because, as we've seen, words can slide even to their contradictory, contradictory meaning. And there are many different names for this transcendental signifier within different situations. It could be God or Allah or Yahweh or Buddha. It could be freedom or the state or the fatherland, whatever one's values, whatever one holds to be the highest values. It could be the king or the queen, the monarch, the dear leader. It could be some concept like love. These are all fantasies of some word, some concept that we take to be the root of all meaning, the root of all other meaning. Thus, it is what guarantees all other words, what guarantees all other concepts, what gives meaning to them. But of course, there is no signifier that is outside of the language system. Even if you are someone who believes in a divine authority, even the word God is still a human word. It's still the human conception of what the divine might be. So the transcendental signifier is always a fantasy, always something that we cannot reach out to, always some desire, something that we hope will give meaning and finalize and settle what it is that we say and hear and read. So now we may ask, how does this new understanding of a language help us to understand literature in a different way? Well, at the very least, what literature does is it gives us sentences that have never been written before, puts words in new orders, uses them to describe things in different ways. So at the very least, a writer just creates new meaning by giving us new sentences, putting the words in a different order than they've been put before. And by these transformations, these transmutations, these different combinations and structures, the concepts that we understand, that we use to understand our world, are transformed through these new structures, through their new arrangement. And so literature pushes conventional meaning to and beyond its limits. It shows us the insufficiency of the language that we have, the insufficiency of the concepts that we have to understand the world. And it does this by activating the ambiguity and playfulness of language. And ambiguity is a good thing. It's very different from vagueness. To be vague is to have an unclear meaning or no meaning. To be ambiguous is to have multiple meanings that are possible. So language in literature is not vague. In good literature, at least, it's not vague. It's ambiguous. And so it makes us conscious of the cognitive act of making meaning out of language. It makes us conscious of the fact that we have to interpret these words and concepts and that the new interpretations that we have to make force us to realize that it's something that we're actually doing, that the meaning is not there in the words, but in our activation and negotiation of their meaning. And finally, it challenges the stability of the context that we use to anchor meaning. It challenges the sufficiency of one cultural context, perhaps, for example, for understanding what it means to be free or what truth is. So these are all the ways in which language in literature functions in complex ways to really transform our very thinking and understanding of the world around us. So some tips on reading literature. First, you want to pay attention to the particularity of the signifiers. The specific word chosen is 
chosen for a reason. Every word is different and every word is important. They're not just synonyms with one another, but every word is going to be important. Explore the chain of signifieds. What concepts are suggested by the signifiers and what met meanings resonate through the chain? That is, if you think about the chain of signifieds as like a web of meaning, and when you pluck any one word, it resonates, it vibrates. Other words will echo, will chime out. Other concepts will chime out and suggest themselves to your ear. So what other concepts or meanings might resonate through the chain when you examine one signifier and signified and see what ideas it contains? Look for patterns, contrasts, contradictions, etc. So again, how do the different implied concepts relate to one another? And are there unconscious ideas that might even, again, go run contrary to the literal or explicit meaning of the text that are evoked by the play of meaning? And explore that field of play. What concepts, figures, or values, ideals, etc. anchor the meaning of the text or guarantee the truth? And is there anything that challenges the primacy of the tri transcendental signifier in this text? What challenges the guarantee of, say, freedom or God or whatever might be the, the absolute ideal that seems to be expressed by this text? Is there anything within the text that challenges the primacy of that figure to guarantee or anchor the meaning? Now, these are all somewhat complex and perhaps abstract sounding tasks, but the more you think about how language works in this complex, multifaceted way that language plays and that meaning is always being created and always extended, the more these questions and these ideas will become second nature and a part of your standard process of reading. So don't worry too much about trying to come up with set answers to these at this point, but just think about what are the submerged meanings what are the ideas that seem to echo or chime or uh, uh, resonate out from beneath this text once I start to play with and think about the ideas that are suggested by the words and how they work together? So, to review, language is a circular system, a self-enclosed system where language leads us to more language, which leads us to more language, never to the outside. And that words refer not to things in themselves, but to our concept of the thing, our understanding of the thing, how it appears to us. That the sign is made up of the signifier and the signified. The word and the concept it refers to together are, in Saussure's theory, what we call the sign. And the signifiers and signifieds relate to each other through this chain, where meaning is defined by difference. Words are different from each other, concepts are different from each other, yet they have this overlap that ties them together so that we cannot have any one individual word or concept without the entire chain attached to it. And finally, that meaning is always at play. Meaning is always ambiguous. The transcendental signifier that anchors meaning is itself arbitrary, temporary, and itself a part of the system that it pretends to anchor but even the most transcendental of transcendental signifiers is a fantasy, is a human creation, is a human concept of something, of what might be, of what could be outside the system of language, what could be real. So these are some ideas to think about as you think about how language works in multiple and complicated ways to create meaning within literature.